such a wealth of resources here. Um, so this is where I work now. Um, it's Cornell Lab Ornithology. This is upstate New York. This is a nature reserve. It used to be a farm field. We, they rebuilt it slowly over time to be a nature preserve, including creating this pond, installing artificial snags. Um, it's a pretty cool place to work. We do a lot of science and conservation work. So there's a lot of outreach to the public, but there's also some really concrete core science that's happening at this institution. So here's uh, an artist painting a humongous mural with all these extant and um, extinct birds drawn at their actual life sizes where they live. It's a beautiful mural. If you're ever in upstate New York, it's probably worth stopping into the visitor center to check out if you like scientific illustration. Those Jay are all extinct? No, some of them are extinct and some of them are extinct, so they're still living. The, the differentiation on the mural is the ones that are living are in color and the ones that are, are um, extinct are black and white. So you can see there's a big black and white bird down at the corner here and over here it even goes into dinosaurs off into the far side of the mural and up the staircase. She actually works out of San Francisco, so you can probably see some of her work. She's done some cool murals up in the Sierra Nevada, Bighorn Sheep um, near Mono Lake. Your eye open. We do cameras. So this is a, you can identify that bird in that picture. Oh, uh, great blue heron. Yeah, it is. It's a great blue heron. There was a big nest for quite a while on our snag. And we put a camera on it and sort of just stream that camera constantly. And we do that with all kinds of birds, albatrosses, condors, expose the drama of raising young to the public. People go crazy for it. There's like people online constantly watching. It's really dialoguing. Community members become experts and sort of take on moderator roles. Classrooms will stream this in the background. Just turn on because there's beautiful nature sounds coming out all day long for the kids to just peek at. Nothing really happens in real time, so there's you know a ton of boring eggs sitting in a nest and then something cool happens. So it's a great fit background for the classroom. Um, there's also a cool app that will help you ID birds, walks you through like where did you see it, which of these bird sizes it like. It's also starting to be able to take a picture that you upload to it and identify it automatically. It's getting there, you know. You know, slow, but if sure. you ever talk to them, an app I'd like to see is where it could take their call. Yeah. We're working on it with Carnegie Mellon. It's a hard problem to solve. Yes, it is. Usually because there's a lot of background noise when you have a, back, a, a bird song. Um, and a lot of dialects. And a lot of, yeah. But absolutely. So we have an entire group at the lab devoted to bird sounds. Um, and they are absolutely working on the Shazam for birds. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen some prototypes of it. Um, so then we also do science. There's a lot of tech that goes into what the kind of science that we do at the lab, what cool things we've built. But the thing we're most famous for is something called citizen science, where about 50 years ago, one of the professors who was working at Cornell figured out that he could collect a lot more data. He started asking the people who were already doing the things that he wanted to do, which was watching birds. People do that recreationally, so we started collaborating with them and collecting data. And so people now will go out and watch birds, but then also report that data back to the lab. And we have a lot of data, a lot of bird observation data. Um, this is eBird. It's our broadest bird collection tool. And we use it to do things like this, which is some really cool spatial modeling. It's built completely from citizen submitted data, showing the migration, an occupancy of a black-throated gray warbler. So you will find those here during breeding season and see how they sort of whoosh, swell up into the US and where they are in each of these different months. Um, that's really a different visualization tool than what you might see in your bird book, which is sort of the static purple, orange, red graphic. It's not that helpful for really figuring out where things are. So this is down to, um, here we go, some size, size square block that they visualize the data, whether or not that bird is there, present or absent. Right? It's a tough bird, given. too, because it's canopy, canopy bird. It's up high. Yeah. So it's, it's tough to spot. Yep. Yeah, it's tougher. This is one you won't see in your backyard. I just grabbed one. It was really recent, and it was kind of cool. So lots of the birds here don't migrate really, not, not as dramatically as some of, these, sort of some of the East Coast birds, where they just whoosh, come up the Mississippi River and then spread out everywhere. This but this was kind of a cool example. So you can kind of see it down here in Texas and it sort of follows the Rio Grande and it comes all the way up and 
occupies the Rocky Mountains and coastal regions. So it doesn't cross borders? <laughs> I mean, not the bird, but the research. Um, it does. So the, these <laughs> occupancy maps are just being focused on in the U.S., but there, we just, there's another really cool graphic out there that shows a bunch of species and their relationships, like where they go in South America in the winter. Um, I, that's a good one to pull up, too, if you want to see it. Uh, Great pick. Yeah. There you go. So there's that bird that was, we were just looking at. Sweet little, sweet, tiny little bird. Tiny little warbler bird. All these warblers are impossibly small. Uh, I've never seen the yellow uh, The spot? <laughs> yeah. I'm always, I, I'm, I work at the lab, we're lodging every time I end up with a bird in my hands. I'm always like, oh. <laughs> um, So the project I have on is called Habitat Network. It's a joint venture of the Nature Conservancy and the Cornell Pornology. If you're interested in it, you can find us on Facebook. We do a lot of primary content development. We you know, interpret a lot of scientific literature, and our primary focus is on um, how backyards could be put to use for wildlife. So we're basically engaging people all over the world, asking them to map their backyards so that we can start to understand what practices really impact uh, wildlife in those backyards. So you know, does putting on a feeder help? What helps the baby birds survive? You know, does it really matter if your cat's outside? How about a brush pile of native plants? All these questions that people have about what they should be doing in the yards. We're trying to collect enough data to start to answer those at a national rather than sort of an anecdotal scale. Um, there, those are the kinds of maps people create. And you get a little bit of data back about how much of your yard is different things. People go a little bit crazy. There's a guy who did his entire office park right down to every single tree that was planted there. So it's uh, there for the taking. Right Good. now, we're running a new kit or just launching a new campaign where we're getting people to pledge to be a lazy gardener. So they'll leave their gardens messy through the fall and not clean up till the spring. Um, so you can. Pledge to be a lazy gardener and even advertise it with a window decal. Oh, okay. It's a real, real conversation starter. <laughs> Someone walks into your house, you're like, yeah, I'm lazy because it's good for the wildlife. It's good stuff. So, um, water. Yes, citizen science is old. Uh, people have been uh, collecting data, utilizing more folks than just themselves as the point of data collection for a really long time. Um, this is data collected about uh, sort of where the winds and the currents are in the ocean. Um, it was unknown for a long time. People, this was in the, the 18 hunts, this is a new story for me, I'm just learning this, this narrative. But, um, I mean, the, this guy Matthew Murray, he was a Navy guy and he was sailing around and you know, sailors were really good about collecting data. They would keep these log books of weather every 15 minutes. They would go up, they'd collect the weather, they would see how fast the wind was blowing, with the, where the sun was, and they would report, but then they would just throw those log books away at the end of the voyage. Um, and so he started to gather all of those up and eventually systematized a data form that he would give out to ships that were going out across the, uh, the sea. And they, people would start to log the data in his data forms and then get that data back to him. And he was then able to produce these charts of wind and currents and tides and whales, where the whales were found at. You can imagine what that was used for. Um, but I've heard rumors that folks say that it, what used to take a year to get from, say, New York to San Francisco in a boat could be the, the time would be decreased to uh, a mere three months because they had so much more information. And he was really open. So as a Navy guy, he was writing very popular. He was like putting this information out there. Um, he, you know, really streamlined it. He gave it not only to Navy ships that were going out to so his own field, but also merchant marines. So these were real amateurs who were helping, based, helping this guy collect all this data. Um, there's also this guy named William Wewo. He did some similar work, but he was a little bit different, mostly because he was an academic. And so he sort of viewed the data that he was getting from people as, uh, <laughs> He used some very interesting language to describe some like subservient folks who were sending me the data. He very much views them as his pawns that he was manipulating in order to get this data that he didn't have access to. And that this sort of describes the fundamental tension in most of citizen science right now is what is the power dynamic between the scientists who are sort of aggregating the data often and the people who are submitting the data, who owns the data, who gets the benefits of the data, Etc. Um, you could 
if you wanted a metaphor for both these guys, you might think of Mari as Tom Sawyer, or I mean, sorry, way well as Tom Sawyer, who like, ha ha ha, I figured out how to make this work really easy for myself, I've got my minions, versus, um, so there we go, subordinate laborers, versus the stone soup model where everybody is like, whoa, we have a big problem we need to solve, let's all add something to it until we get something greater than the sum of our parts. Um, so says so that's old. That's, those are some really old examples. Amateurs have been doing science around the world forever. But this phrase, citizen science, has really picked up in popular culture in the last five years in a way that uh, you probably have heard it sort of bubble to the surface. I mean, this, this, this library series is called Citizen Science. It's become a catchphrase in a really important way. So this is, of course, uh, interest over time in the phrase citizen science uh, through Google searches. There's also a lot of citizen science projects. Uh, you can find basically anything you want to do. Uh, you can culture your belly button. You can send, get a kit to swab your belly button out and they'll tell you what kind of bacteria you have in your belly button. You can help people classify um, galaxies. You can look at wildlife camps and help people see when mammals wander through the camera and try to identify that. You can uh, to report on the number of birds that you have. Uh, it's really a wide-ranging, <coughs> ever-expanding ways to get involved so that they match your, uh, match your interests, your hobbies. I really like this one. So you'll find these, uh, these camera blocks in strange places that help you set your, your phone up in exactly the right position so that you can take a picture of that particular nature scape when you're there that looks exactly like the picture that everyone has come before you so they can stitch those pictures together and start to see environmental change over time without having to do a lot of manipulation of the images. I don't remember why I stuck this in here. Maybe just because it was exciting that we have a lot of environmental stuff going on right now in the U.S. Um, a lot of high stakes things are happening. Half of our country is flooded, the other half of it's on fire. Uh, so, I, so where the rubber hits the road for me with citizen science as a learning researcher is that, yeah, we can collect great data from people who are willing to work with us to put all that data into one communal pot, but it also is really empowering for individuals. People become good citizens, citizens of the world, not necessarily in that sort of nationalistic sense, through that process of co-creating knowledge. Um, and it can be, become a real force for change when you think about citizen science that way. Um, I would note that, you know, the, the small, small, even a small action in your local area can create something really big. You can see here's all the data points in one year that one project collected. Um, it, even though you might be making a very small local action, um, that local action is more meaningful in that it becomes this tool that you can use to subvert other kinds of power structures. Um, so if you know what's going on and you're part of this collective, collaborative network of folks, you can deprive sort of scare scenarios or misinformation campaigns of a lot of their power if you as an individual local actor are connected to individual local actors in other places. It looks like Russia was not so much involved uh, for some reason. For some reason. I mean, to be fair, their population density is really um, not great in the more reaches of the world. So there's that reason, but yes, it is absolutely not as uh, participatory. Um, and they are such a large country that they have their own systems for this kind of stuff, or this kind of stuff is sub subverted and they're not allowed to do it because there's a lot of power in people having access to knowledge and information. Um, so the dots on the ocean are like uh, old reports? Yeah, so this is birds. Okay. This is bird data. So this is people reporting, reporting birds. So you'll see people on ocean On uh, eBird? Um, this, yeah, this is probably eBird and the Avian Knowledge Network. So scientists sometimes don't use eBird. They put it right into something called the Avian Knowledge Network, which aggregates data from eBird and a bunch of other data um, sources. This one sad thing, or a second sad thing, is that it looks like the, the rainforest in Brazil is succumbing to um, technology. It's getting filled in with dots instead of being 
Okay. And there's a lot of empty space there. I mean, you can definitely see the river in the middle where people who would be purporting birds to eat bird might be journeying. Okay. Um, and the dots are quite large compared to the geographic space that they actually represent. That's so true. It's a little bit of a, you know, statistics lie, map markers lie too. <laughs> Um, so, some great examples, um, in North Carolina, researchers have really been studying this group of volunteers that have taken on monitoring the nesting sites of walkerhead sea turtles, um, and they've been able to demonstrate that those volunteers and the community surrounding the people who are the actual volunteers have become, you know, sort of local experts in this particular species and the conservation of their beaches, and they now are actually able to um, help to co-manage these beaches in a way that the local, um, I guess, the government agencies weren't doing effectively. So they've gathered enough information and are armed to the degree now that they have been able to influence the local uh, authorities that are supposed to be guarding these turtles. Um, and they even have been adapting their management practices as they've gone through this um, because of the data that they've collected as a result of having this pretty broad ranging committed volunteer group on the ground. And so there's hundreds of people who just do a little bit, monitor the, net, the, the turtle nests one day a year, and yet together they've been able to build this whole community up that has helped to preserve this entire species. Um, Brightsville Beach, they have their own logos, they um, built their own systems for protecting the, the, the nests, they go out, they collect the eggs and keep them out of danger, so they've got these entire Entire systems that come in and involve the students and the kids. They've, you've probably seen the gross pictures of, with the straws up the turtles' noses. They're the folks who figured out that that was happening in a profound way to these sea turtles and started putting those pictures out on social media, showing how much trash is associated with turtle nests in their beaches and how that impacts nesting cycles. And so this is a great example of um, a local community helping to change the way that researchers are used around. Where is Riceville Beach? I have no idea. Somewhere in North Carolina. I don't know North Carolina well enough to tell you. Okay. Good enough. Good enough for you. <laughs> um, so then you know, there's lots of these questions like, well, what have, do people ever actually influence policy? That's a big question that often comes up with citizen science pressure from the citizens themselves. Like nobody likes to throw effort into a void, right? That's the worst thing ever to feel like you're out pounding the beach every day or whatever your passion is and having that data not actually amount to anything. It's a really, um, it, it eats away at your motivation. But you, you start to see that there is evidence that um, policy changes depending on how many people are involved and how much they are involved. Um, so here we have different <coughs> scales of impact and how much participant monitoring is going on. And the idea here is that um, the more people you have involved, the speed at which policy changes uh, is really impacted. And so that's, that's a pretty powerful data. Uh, and so it also is a reflection of where you're trying to change policy at. So if you're really working at the local area, policy can change really quick. If you want to scale up from your local effort to influence global policy, that of course is, is much trickier. But lots of people don't even believe that this happens. But there are several instances and enough to study uh, that these guys found that it does indeed, uh, it does indeed allow, allow uh, policy at local scales to change if you get enough folks involved locally. Um, so this gets, you know, messier, there's a lot of, uh, there's, there's a lot of racial dimensions to environmental monitoring. So this is the case of hog farming. Um, folks started to get together and map out uh, where these hog farms were at and deploy air, moder air monitoring sort of sensors into people's hands. They put them out to the folks who were living near hog farms and try to understand, like, what is the impact of having these hog farms near residential areas. I don't know how much you know about industrial hog farming. It's highly automated. So you have big, long row houses. You have a catchment pond where they pump out the crap that the pigs produce after eating. And then what they do with this pond is they spray it onto a field, which effectively aerializes all of the um, ammonias, the hydrogen sulfides, all of the 
hog fecal waste particles into the air, which can be picked up by the wind and drift over to, you can see the proximity of people's living um, arrangements to, to those hog farms. And so people complained. Um, there's two hogs sold for every person who lives in the Carolinas. Uh, that's pretty profound. That's just the ones that are sold every wow. year. Um, so 18 million of them in any given year. So the, the, the folks who were working on this research, a guy named Dr. Wing, he led the analysis of more than 2,500 of these industrial hog farms, and he found that even adjusting for population density, the majority of um, the farms were close to poor people. I, that's not surprising. Poor people have far less power than people with money, and so you do get the um, arrangement of these local uh, environmental hazards in those kinds of areas. But that doesn't mean that we you know, should walk away from that fact of the way the world works. What, what they think is important then is putting technology and connecting them to experts so that they can help to monitor their own systems and connect that to their health issues and then put a case against, against folks who are doing these big industrial hog farmings. So they did, they set up a bunch of automated recorders to, to measure dust, hydrogen sulfide, all the stuff that's in the fecal matter. Um, they had about 100 people who really took part in really intensive surveys about their health in, a, in addition to the air monitoring stations. And they, uh, they had to go out, so they had to go outside twice a day and breathe for 10 minutes and then monitor their health. They collected their saliva. They looked at lung function with machines that they were given. And they were, uh, their saliva was analyzed. Um, and, you know, that led to this pretty clear, uh, pretty clear trend of these hog farms impacting disproportionately non-white folks, um, which they then have used to put a case against hog farms and force them to clean up their environmental, uh, their environmental impact, which is good. This is Blue Map. It's uh, a really cool thing that's happening in China. So basically, the Environmental Protection Agency in China, called IPE, it's a different acronym for the same function, has put out this big map and allowed people to, so it has like all the locations of all the farms in China on it and you can log in and report any kind of pollution you see any around a specific factory. And um, they just passed legislation that allows the data that's collected in these kinds of citizen monitoring tools to be used to pressure those factories to clean up some of their environmental outputs. They being China? They being China. So that law is pretty new, 2015. So it's a whistleblower law in China, and this is now sort of a app-driven whistleblower tool. So a blue map doesn't work in the United States? No, it's a Chinese-based program. And I would, well, I'll show you something that came out today that gives us hope for the future. But it's just like, wow, China, that's the crappy place where you don't want to live. And yet this is a pretty cool tool if they're actually able to follow through and hold some of those corporations accountable. Um, so yeah, there's more, more screenshots of it. Yeah, they have a really short timeline too. So it's seven days that they aggregate reports and they have to, there for public comment and review in that short time period, everyone gets notifications that they've been reported and then they have to take action after that short, short time period. Um, so citizen science, woo, knowledge production, social capital, environmental justice can all come from this kind of work. All right, so this is straight from somebody else's work, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try it because I think it's kind of cute. So we're going to tell the story with stick figures. She's getting really cute there. We are all the same. So the story of citizen science, many people wonder where knowledge comes from. In the status quo, and I would argue it's not quite true, given lots of these examples, but often what happens is that scientists make knowledge inside a black box that's hidden from a lot of public view. Um, most scientists wouldn't identify it as such. Like, I don't know, working at the university, I always thought, oh, everything we do is accessible. Anyone who wants can come to these talks. You know, it's, it's open. But there are other kinds of barriers in place, social cultural barriers that sort of work to keep that divide between scientists and the actual public fairly rigorous. So while it's not regulated that way, in fact it is. Well, often the data is not available, right? Yeah, and I'll tell you a couple of interesting stories about that. But, but even to explain to kids how, like when you get, like they get the kids book and it says something like, oh, you know, whales do this or whatever it is, and they, they say we did it, we figured it out. They're, they're, 
to really understand yeah. how they did it. Oh, we figured it out, yeah. Right. And it's just I mean, it's black box I mean, that even way. Even knowing what I know, being a teacher, yeah. a science teacher, I couldn't tell them exactly what happened, that they quite answer the questions that kids have. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. And most scientists can't do that outside their immediate field either. So that's, I mean, there is some complexity. So, you know, now science communicators, we have a whole army of them. There's science communication program up at UC Santa Cruz. It's super um, great and well known. You know, they translate and deliver the new knowledge. Hey, here's some new research on avian olfactory receptor AG repertories, blah, 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 blah. And then they are basically like, hmm, birds can spell. So they write the, you know, the popular article on that. Um, but with citizen science, I think the goal is for many scientists, at least those who are in the stone soup camp and have rethought what their role is in society to sort of gather people, solve problems in communities, you know, using the, the help of the people who are the most interested or impacted by whatever phenomenon is occurring. This is their goal, is to tear down that black box and work together. Uh, that's to say there aren't still scientists out there who do view the scientists that they work with as subordinated sort of laborers, like people that they rely on to get data. And it's not even that nefarious, but um, people feel that way. We have a lot in common. So we all make observations and we're all curious. Every single person has looked around the world and seen something interesting. It's just an absolute no-brainer that this happens. Kids do it, adults do it. I notice stuff in my garden. You know, I ask questions. And thought, there's all kinds of ways that we observe uh, the natural yeah, world. Yeah, it's six little. <laughs> so that I only have, only have four little, four little, little, little stick figures. They leave so much to be designed. We all experiment. Everyone is doing this all day long. They might not call it that, but you, you tweak stuff or change stuff. We all think and wonder, we're all creative, we're all motivated for discovery, we all enjoy doing things, yes, thank you, Stick Figures, we do all enjoy doing things, uh, and we share what we know, so this is a big one, um, you can see this symbolized by the web or by talking to other people. Uh, the web is an amazing tool, and I would say is responsible for that uptick in citizen science that you see. Being able to organize people in online context and aggregate data and visualize it back for folks, that's real. That's really amazing. It's great that the Maury's and the Weebles could do with the world before. They pu put up their publication with their charts, but that had a limit to how many people it could reach the web. It's just all right there. We face big problems. Um, you know, scientific knowledge alone is not enough. This is a huge one with climate change. So here we'll talk a little bit about some of the roadblocks that are in the way of access. So yes, so we've got this poor guy. He said some stuff that the church didn't like and wrote a bunch of books um, about sort of how people think, or not people, just like what thought is in the world. And he got burned on top of a pile of his books in Switzerland, pretty brutal. You've got Galileo. Everyone knows Galileo's story. He got locked up. Um, and this yeah, is still for happening. the truth. Yes. He got locked up for the truth. He got locked up for the truth, right? He got locked up for because he was spreading the truth primarily, like putting out books about it and trying to get other people to think with him. So the spread of knowledge. This guy, Aaron Schwartz, so he was a um, big player in Reddit. Uh, he made the mistake of going into uh, MIT and setting up a server there that was basically harvesting scientific literature from the, so, so he created a dummy account and he was using that dummy account to suck articles out of the databases at MIT and po post those articles so that they were freely available online. And he got arrested by campus police and was being, um, because that's illegal, right? You can't take stuff that's owned by a journal and put it out publicly. There's copyright laws against that. Intellectual property. That's right. So there's, there's, that, there's a lot of intellectual property, and he and he was awaiting his trial. He killed himself um, in his in his room. So he uh, he's sort of people like to say a modern day Galileo for trying to make this knowledge accessible in a way that it's not. You've got this Kazakh Kazakh girl. Um, she is doing something very similar. So she started a website called Science Hub and is, has made, I think, uh, 50 million scientific articles 
online available, mm -hmm. um, so freely and publicly available. And she's, you know, seen as a um, radical. Yeah, she's pretty. She seems pretty radical, although uh, you know, places like a Science, a Science Journal, they've named her one of the most t ten most important people in you know science movers and shakers. There is a movement in science for everything to be open. It's sh changing the open science movement, so making new data publicly. The big journals that are wealthy enough now, you can get almost all the data sets online. A lot of them are impenetrable if you don't know how to work with that data, but it doesn't mean it's not there. Um, and you know, even down to young scientists are often practicing with what you call open notebooks, so they'll put everything that they're finding in their experiments, how they set up their experiments, all available openly online, which is a really different way of doing stuff. Um, not necessarily politically uh, <laughs> correct. <laughs> no, I mean, there's a lot of questions about that, too. How do you get credit um, and advance in your field if the work that you're doing is publicly available to be stolen? Um, and so these are all big questions the fields are struggling with, and as a field, because it's you know, lots and lots of people who are part of this system. This is not you with them, right? <clears throat> With who? It's not new. I mean, keeping your no your data and all your work secret. And that's how. What's her, her name? You didn't get the Nobel Prize for the DNA. Right. Thing. It's not new. They stole her crystal and her pictures. It's not new at all. Um, it's the way things have functioned for a really long time. Yeah. Are there legal actions against her? Um, I'm not sure. I'm guessing there are. I bet. I bet like Elsa Lever and some of the big journal aggregators are absolutely irritated that she has their stuff up publicly. Um, I don't know. Oh, she's from Kazakhstan. She's yeah, she, so she's kind of insulated because she doesn't live. In fact, she's going to graduate school um, at an undisclosed location. <laughs> <laughs> so, very she's not a dreamer, is she? Uh, <laughs> Uh, she did come here to Harvard, I think, to finish her BS. Okay. But um, she then subsequently went back to Kazakhstan, where she launched SciHub, and then has started graduate school in an situation. We need each other and all the social capital. That if we're going to solve these big, big, chaotic, messy problems that are facing the Earth, we, there's just basically no way to do it. And I find that true in my own project. The kind of data that we collect, I absolutely, like, you know, one of the things we focus on is not just stopping climate change by changing the way you landscape, but also um, it's happening. So how do we mitigate it in our yards or prepare for it so that we sort of have climate change proof yards? Um, and that's that's one of the things that we focus on as well. We just I ha we have to have a lot more people in that conversation than just a handful of scientists who are able to focus on it professionally. Um, so here we go. This is a pretty famous Clay Shirky example. We did the math. Hey, this guy has something called cognitive surplus that he's really interested in. Clay Shirky. Is that for? Is that? Is it goggle boxes or Google? Google. 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 Did you just spell it? Goggle boxes. Goggle. I didn't know that. I thought it was something else. Did you work correct? Goggle. Anyway, Wikipedia is massive, right, guys? It's like gigantic, built on this army of volunteers putting in just hours and hours and hours over it. You can basically find anything you want. The most obscure topic has been neatly hammered out in Wikipedia. That took about 100 million hours of manpower, volunteer manpower. I sure the estimates that there's a cognitive surplus just in TV time, just by US adults of 200 billion hours. So think how many Wikipedias we could create if we tapped into even just a tiny, tiny part of that cognitive. You don't even have to give up all your TV time. Just tiny bit of your TV time, and there's this immense volunteer world out there whose hobbies and interests and efforts could be being put to more uses. And Clay's pretty convinced that, uh, it's like one well, first name turns, I've never even met him. Clay Shirky is, is convinced that there's this revolution coming where these surplus hours are going to be put to use in ways that, maybe <laughs> Teresa's is like salary, she's like, all those people could be sitting on my board instead of Watch your TV. <laughs> Think of the museum we could have. But it's true. So helping people make that transition from passive use of their extra time um, into putting some small part of it towards a more active purpose is a really cool thing that could happen, or is happening, and has happened for many people. 
but the more people we get to do it, we have a ton of power. I'm sure someone in this room is a citizen scientist. I'm sure someone else you know is a citizen scientist. You know, there's 1.5 million people putting report, uh, people, reports going into eBird. There's a massive army of people who monitor bodies of water all over the country. If you don't know one of them, I'd be surprised. Uh, almost every major body of water has some, some small community group that's doing some sort of testing there. Uh, SETI at Home is a cool program uh, that lets SETI utilize your home computer when, during its downtime as part of its cognitive processing. So you can sign up for that and devote your excess computer hours, so your, your computer's cognitive surplus to uh, search for extraterrestrial life. While you're watching TV. While you're watching TV, <laughs> you don't have to do anything. I don't know if that counts as your cognitive surplus, though. Um, if you are not a in science project, I can guarantee there is one for you. So this is SciStarter. It tries to find every citizen science project out there and make sure that you can find them and look up ones that are meant for you by topic or by location. Um, it is what it is. It's cool that it's out there. You might like it. This How long has it been out there? Um, so soon, uh, SciStarter has been around while they just redid their, so this is SciStarter 2.0 is what they call it, so it's better. The search is better. They've got an army, not an army, I keep using that term, a bunch of people who are out there actively recruiting um, people who are running citizen science projects to utilize their database, so it's much more robust than it was a year ago. But you'll, I, I would be surprised if you didn't find something that you thought was really interesting through SciStarter. There's an entire, so these projects aren't on SciStarter, although they might be now, they might have resolved their conflict. You know, this is a big enough field that there's little conflicts and like um, uh, rivalries emerging. So this is Zooniverse, it runs out of the, uh, the museum, the, the science museum in Chicago. Uh, they do cool projects, and you can go there. There's lots and lots of them now. It originally started with a project called Zooniverse which classified um, just, so astronomers just have so many pictures of universes that the Hubble telescope has taken. So many pictures that they can't get through them all. An entire grad student's career could be spent looking at pictures of the universe and classifying them, 10 grad students. And that was a big waste of um, you know, a single person's time. So they built basically this game where they taught people the different shapes of universes and then let them flip through that big catalog of pictures and the people Many of them, 10, would say, this is a spiral, this is a different kind of universe, and they would label them, and then suddenly, boom, that data set was categorized and usable. You mean galaxy, right? Galaxy, not universe. Galaxies. Um, they even had somebody uh, in their community forum start to talk about a particular kind of shape of galaxy that they didn't know existed prior to these people noticing it and telling the, uh, the scientists who run the project. And so there's this one paper by Zooniverse that has like 300 authors on it. <laughs> it's all the people who were participated in the conversation to identify this green pea galaxy, uh, which is pretty cool. But there's a bunch of projects now, so there's wildlife cameras, you can, bad uh, guys. Uh, so all those old logs from ships, there's a project called Old Weather, and you can go in and transcribe the, each of the logs and, make that data searchable and usable to help us understand climate change. Great project. Uh, corporations are doing citizen science. If you are in, you know, connected to a corporation, there are many programs, EarthWatch is a great one. Uh, they've got a bunch of work that they do with banks to get people who are in their jobs active in some sort of data collection project in their city. So it's another route to go if that's the world that you live in right now. Um, here, there's you know, really niche things like the California King Tides community. You might not even know it exists, but there's a way for you to get involved in that. Um, the Surfrider Foundation, I think they're active in Santa Cruz, but all up and down the coast, so they monitor water. Um, I think these guys are the ones who developed a special fin that they sometimes will give people to attach their surfboard that will monitor the temperature of water as they're out um, surfing around. There's probably some other sensors in there too. Is that the fin with high heels? <laughs> Could be. <laughs> it's definitely fancy. Um, oh, and this is what I want to tell you about. So just today, so almost two years ago, Wyoming passed a law that said that citizens weren't allowed to collect citizen science data on private property in Wyoming anymore, which is a, so they would, 
Uh, usually waterways are publicly available, so you could walk up a stream, say, into a rancher's land and collect water samples from that stream, and they were like, no, that's absolutely illegal. You're not allowed to do that. That's a criminal offense. Um, even if you're collecting data for these, this larger purpose of monitoring the environment um, and finding uh, pollution sources. So just today, the Tenth Circuit, Circuit Court of Appeals, they, um, they said that that was illegal. And so now people in Wyoming are free to do that again. Can I read that? We, something the plaintiff's collect, collection of resource data constitutes the protected, protection of speech. So um, they think that being able to collect data about your environment that is around you is protected speech. So what do they got to hide? Uh, all sorts of things. Absolutely, I mean, mines, ED. ranchers, yeah. Yeah. disposing of products, and polluting waterways. This, this came up because of waterways, so that was the fundamental thing. You had ranchers lobbying to um, get people who were monitoring their pollution off their land so they couldn't be held accountable for it. Um, so this was really exciting to come across today. It was a little scary when it happened. Whoa. How, like, am I sending people out into criminal circumstances? And how does that, that, that you know, makes you pause? That's not what you sign up for. So they could walk up across the private property to get to the waterway? No, you have no. to walk up Usually the you have to walk up the waterway. Up the waterway. Yeah. Okay. Which is not particularly good for the waterway. <laughs> no, you know, and it's not heavy sampling that they're doing, but um, it is sampling. Neither is a lot of cow poop in the creek. Um, so most of these slides, which is why I fumbled through them, are from a colleague named Carrie Cooper. Uh, she just published this book called Citizen Science, How Ordinary People Are Changing Face of the Discovery. If you want to read the stories that I just told in better, more interesting, and in-depth form, that book is where you will do it. Yeah, she just started as a professor. She's worked at Cornell with me in the past. She's a professor of public um, participation in scientific research at quite happy there. And, oh, is that my last slide? Wow. So, I, I mean, I just, yeah. I think, I don't know, how many of you guys do citizen science already? What projects do you guys work with? Um, well, I'm working with Groundswell Ecology and um, State Parks at Seabright Beach. Okay. And um, we, I wanted to come because I think that eventually, since the project is going so well as far as the habitat restoration that we eventually we're going to need the data as far as the wildlife that is returning and this is something where we could use a lot more citizen scientists to help like I mean I know that you know there was a bio blitz done at UCSC this, right. this year and, and etc maybe you know like we could use a bio blitz or I'm not sure how to put this together but this is something that's local that um, that people have, have, can stop by and help us collect data. Yeah, so I think that's a local project. So you're interested in all wildlife observations, basically? Well, yeah, I mean, because there's so much change going on there. Um, Gold School Elementary is already involved, and they we're teaching them how to, you know, just in this little area, what plants are you seeing? What yeah. what are the non-native things that are left here? So there's we're teaching the children in the school area at Galt oh. Elementary. Oh. At the no, the they're taking to the yeah. beach so that they oh, not in the school yeah. yard. Oh, we they actually physically come out and are actually okay. doing this. Because I think they just out dug up there. the whole yard here. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, do they, they depave Galt? No, it's not paved. They actually put down sod okay. on top of the. Pavement, or they they it? Cool. And where are they documenting? Like, are they using iNaturalist as the tool? Well, I'm on iNaturalist, and yeah, some of the people involved in the project are separately on iNaturalist, but the project is only, you know, less than four years old, so there's a lot of things that we could do that aren't being done yet. Right, yeah. Um, and have you looked at the iNaturalist data for Seabright Beach more than just your submitting? Like just seeing what's pa passively, so if you have enough data, people passively giving you data about organisms, that might be enough for you to start looking across time. So just look at Seabright Beach and look at every observation that's been made there by everybody. 
okay. would be a really cool way uh -huh. to start to build that data set. Uh -huh. And then I do think you're on to it with bio blitzes. Um, so either you have the school start to reorganize the way they do their work into bio blitzes so mm -hmm. that it's more systemic, or you know, organize them through the Natural History Museum is a great great tool. Yeah, because it's right across right. the street and we do partner on some things with them as well. I would be surprised if they didn't want to ride that bio blitz. Um, and then uh, there's a national movement on Citizen Science Day, which is in the spring, to do bio blitzes um, citywide. And so that's a great, you could piggyback off of all the press that comes from that event if Santa Cruz was to join up. And so the Natural History Museum would be the natural person to be like, hey, can you get Cal Academy spearheads that at this point? Because mm -hmm. iNaturalist is housed there. Mm -hmm. um, so they would be, you know, they'd be like, hey, we should do Citizen Science Day, ne day next year. Let's do a citywide bio blitz. It'd be a really cool, cool way to build without having to do all the publicity yourself because that's really your major problem. Yeah. Um, and what did you participate in? Well, maybe it dignifies it a little too much for calling it <laughs> Citizen Science, but I like to think of it as Citizen Science. Yeah. Um, and we do. Uh, submit data to eBird a uh -huh. lot. I love uh -huh. eBird. I'm I think totally great. amazed at eBird. I can't believe I'm participating in that now. But we, we got started because we were worried about uh, recreational boating and paddling on the river, which is illegal, but they're trying to make it legal. So we were questioning that and doing some research about the effect it would have on the bird life. So we what started river? San Lorenzo River, the urban stretch of the river. Okay. Um, so four of us started it and we Actually, we do a blog now, a regular blog on bird life on the river. And that's so that's got me and others of us out mm -hmm. onto the river, counting the birds and submitting it to, um, and it's actually had kind of a political effect. We were actually able to temporarily at least, and I think it's dead now, the, the paddling on the river. And just this morning I was out questioning the public works because they're removing a lot of vegetation. Oh no! Yeah, so. So we're going back to the uh, governing document, San Lorenzo Urban River Project. Um, Take from a garden messy for wildlife. Yeah, so, so it, you know, journalism part and the citizen science part all kind of, and the political activism all kind of blend. Yeah, and even just a plain boring old bird watching tool like eBird, which is not playing a boring doll because so many people submit data. It's actually awesome. Um, it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I, I got a couple things. First of all, um, I appreciate eBird. It's it's a great uh, a share like resource, like what you're talking about. Yeah, yep. everyone science. putting it in the pot. Yeah, and um, unfortunately, I don't like always contribute when I go out birding. Neither does anybody. Yeah, today I went up to uh, UCSC and uh, and I saw like uh, eight uh, wild turkeys. And then I saw like three uh, Cooper's hawks playing in the sky, and then a golden eagle came oh, over cool. and, and, and flew over. And so they're still here, but they're they've been here. But back to the river, um, I find it disconcerting not only for the birds but for the fish that at the bottom of the river, down at the boardwalk, they'll like bulldoze it in, close off the river bottom to raise the river right. level in town so it looks more um, aesthetic. But it's you not know, for the fish. Especially at weekends and stuff like that. I thought but it was for the got, fish. It's not for the fish? Aren't there fish that no, breed in the No, the, the fish need an open, they need, they need to be, the fish, the spawn need to get in and out. How come there's all those signs, everyone knows the signs up that say don't Breach. breach the levee, it'll kill all the baby fish. Well, really, the boardwalk wants to breach it because it floods their machinery underlying the boardwalk. And so they illegally breach it every year. And we're trying to stop them from illegally breaching. There are also people who just want to get out there. What, what do you mean, breach it? They, they need it as a, as a lagoon for the smolts. I mean, they need it as a kind of a nursery okay. area. A natural river Floats. does its own thing. They and the when they thing. manipulate it, they block it off. It traps fish that are yeah, but it's already bred in England, and, it, and, and fish going in and out can't do it. Yeah, but it's already manipulated by the leave it levees that are there so that we don't have flooding. I mean, if we had just wide open flooding, it would be a whole different place. I'm thinking of Rio del Mar Beach right now. So there's a similar creek that flows into Rio del Mar, and it naturally dams up without nobody's out there 
damming that, and so I'm guessing they're trying to recreate that same natural damming that happens? They don't happens. have to recreate it because the sandbar there right. forms every year naturally. What happens artificially is the breaching, but the sandbar forms and right. that's how this works. Cool. Well, what do the fish do when the sandbar is there? If the fish want to get out to the They get eaten by birds. Well, the, as, as I understand it, it's very useful as a nursery. They need a transition. The young fish need a transition area. So that's the time of year when the fish need the transition area and the sandbar naturally forms. So they're sort of synchronized. So nobody's damming it up in the winter rainy season when right. there's no young fish oh, there. It's a very limited season. But yeah, yeah I mean, it's all are, complicated. They are damming it up. You, you think it's dammed in February? No, 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 no. Yeah. Not, not that early in the year, but in the summertime. Yeah, in the summertime. They do it for aesthetic reasons. I talked to a naturalist who was down there doing uh, um, observation for the new bridge that they just put across uh, San Lorenzo Park. Brand, the Brands 40 oh, Bridge. Oh, the Brands 40, yeah, the Brands 40 Bridge is complete now. But during that process, they had to take a tree out. He was down there checking out birds that were uh, um, nesting. Time. Yeah. And uh, there was a hummingbird nesting in the tree that took out the little sacrifice that situation. But he said that um, they 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 not breach, but they create the damming to to Keep run water. the water up to homeless takes away homeless uh, camping areas. Right, it raises the river and, and it's more static. So you think this small thing is a lie? You think that's a, that, that, that's sort of a misinformation campaign? So that people think I, it's for yeah, sure logical reasons? I'm sure there's something that's information going on there. <laughs> See, we all need yeah. we all need more access to what's happening. What are these small, yeah. anyway? Yeah, my information is exactly the opposite because there's been so much protesting by the neighborhood down there because of the flooding that happens during when the sandbar is in place. That it's it's the, it's a, a lot of public pressure. It should be or it should be a floodplain, but because we built on the floodplain, there's so much pressure from the boardwalk and from the neighborhood to break through that and, and let the let the water out. And the environmentalists are trying to protect the lagoon during the summer season. So what do you think would happen if no one was messing with it? The water would because at Rio de Mar right. it just like, naturally like you said it would dam it would dam naturally. Uh -huh. And that would break that would break, yep. So perhaps, so, you know. Maybe we're taking it to too many And that's to get it on tides days. and yeah. like the winter we had this year was like a normal winter as opposed Wait, to that like our, our, our uh, <laughs> the Sorry, last, I, last few winters we had like a drought and not a lot of rain. I had a baby in 2012 in December and the first time it rained, he was like 18 months old. What is this? And I was like, oh my gosh, you're like a little Bedouin baby. I've never seen a in the sky. It's a really dramatic drought. <laughs> I was totally like, what's happening? We, we've got a cat that's like that. Every time it rains. <laughs> He's used to it now after last one you were Um Yeah, so I. I, I I personally um, would love to clarify my narrative on the importance of local action as sort of the building blocks for much of society. So almost everything that comes to life in our society starts <coughs> with local actions at home that individuals are taking and talking talking to one another about. And uh, you know, when something like the election and um, November happened that changed so many people's perspective on their relationship to the government. It makes you feel panicked and out of control. And I, I do think that participation in any kind of organized effort at the local level, whether that's citizen science, I happen to think that people being involved in science is radical and important because of the knowledge blockers that are there and the way that you, you can discover that those aren't really barriers to being in conversations with process of knowledge production. Um, and so, yeah, that's the narrative that I'm trying to hone in on here, and you know, I think it's so, so therapeutic for different people to, to recognize the power in sort of radical everyday activity. So do you think that 
the reason that we can do this now is the internet. I think it plays a huge role in it and made it a lot easier. Because, I mean, you know, like, um, I, can't, um, I don't even know how many years ago it was when I was doing water monitoring in schools. Right. You know, I mean, what happened to they, that data? I mean, who knows? Right? right, the water monitors are always like, we're throwing data into a boy. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we published it, we had six schools and we published it so everybody in the school got it, but then, what, yeah. those eighth graders grew up and you know, that was right. That's yeah, usually on. those water monitoring groups formed in response to some sort of critical crisis at the local level, and so they were collecting data for a purpose to answer a specific question or to inform some public policy that was getting made, like, should we have a new park or should this development go in, um, how much pollution from that particular plant is getting into the water and so you have these groups spring up as a response to that kind of activity and they would collect the data they would provide that data to their council and then that would help right. they hope to make a decision and then you saw things like teachers recognizing the power of getting kids out stomping around the creek and so they would continue these sort of mimicking of the water protocols even though that call that urgent call to collect the data wasn't there anymore so there wasn't that organizing entity to take that data and turn it into something um, but now that problem is solved because you can use apps and yeah, submit because, a because the, the, the people who kept the data, like I can think of two examples just recently that we were just in Kingston, New York on the Hudson River right. and um, they did urban renewal and um, somebody back in uh, 1960 uh, took pictures of all the stuff they took down. Yeah, and that's pretty cool, huh? I mean, that was, that's yeah. amazing. And somebody saved, and they saved it all these years until somebody just recently said, oh, let's make a movie about it. Now they have all this stuff, and it's hmm. a real long movie. And there's this guy, I don't know if you know, Dan, Dan Smiley, who um, kept all the environmental climate at Bowling Preserve. And yeah, the Shungums. The Shungums. And um, that stuff was something that somebody saved. And so now they have stuff that's back from the 1930s, 1920-something. All that data is collected and it's available for people to use to see what it was like back then, which is a, a treasure because it's yeah. it's hard to find. Yep, that's even a problem with scientists who collect really interesting data and then it's just on their own mm -hmm. single hard drive and it and where is it's lost that? or it's on a freaking floppy disk. Like who? Who can read a floppy disk? Yeah, right. well, but even if you put it on the internet now, yes. somebody has to know where to go and look. For yep, it. absolutely. Yeah, I was at the Library of Congress a few years ago and. That was their primary question. Is they were like, well, have, like the internet's moving so fast. Help us to identify how we archive science now. We used to archive it by, you know, talking to the universities. Microfiche. Well, and they would just collect all the famous scientists. They would just collect all the correspondence from their filing cabinets. Um, and that's not how science is done anymore. So my, my husband's a plant scientist, and like a lot of his science takes place in like chat between two people. Those are just gone. Like all that stuff that would have happened in formal letter that's now, you know, the older people's science is documented, the Library of Congress, that stuff is all, you can't see it happening anymore. And so they really panicked about how you preserve that information. Well, it should just cooperate with the NSA. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been great advice. <laughs> I recommend a partnership between you and the NSA. <laughs> All your woes will be solved. Mm. Yes. Do you, have a, do you have a sort of perspective on Santa Cruz County and where the sort of hot spots are in terms of collecting data? Or is there any, any, you know, anything that you want to see happen? Um, I mean, I think the issue of coastal governance is, is big here. What? Coastal governance, so like the interface of the public and the ocean. There's a lot of entities that are responsible for monitoring that. You know, the city councils and the county is set up to sort of govern that in very specific ways. I think there's a lot of space there for people to um, add more to the kind of knowledge that's informing, say, our zoning laws and things like that. Um, land trust. Land, the land trust. I just bought some yummy beer at discretion. It was funding the land trust, I thought that was pretty neat. Santa Cruz is a pretty intellectual county. Um, I don't see a ton of gaps, really like obvious gaps, where there's not a ton of, not, there's not somebody who's sort of paying attention to it loosely. Um, and, and the agriculture stuff, I, I live in Watsonville, so that that's an interesting space, right? Um, 
like any agricultural community, there's a lot of issues at the interface of something that's being used industrially and the schools and homes that surround those spaces. Um, so there's some space for extra work there. Oh, oh you know, um, yeah, I mean, I, when you talk to people who are in charge of farms, their hope is to go organic, right? So they're waiting for the market to catch up to want enough people to want to purchase organic produce so that they can justify growing it. That makes you smirk, but. <laughs> it's not happening with strawberries. Right, that, right. They, they kill the soil, Nothal sulfate. Bromide. Nothal bromide. They tan it, they kill it. Nothing's alive in the soil. And then they add all the nutrients that they want. It's, it's, it makes it's big, soil. beautiful, sexy strawberries that people want to purchase. They don't taste good. Yeah, they yeah. They don't, they don't taste fresh and they don't, uh, and, and there's residual chemicals in the, in the strawberries. It's, it's great for. Right, so the, 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 the I mean, and, and it's actually the biggest risk not isn't to the consumer in that case, it's to the farm workers who are farming those fields, which there's a real risk of exposure there. People can generally guard from exposure to insecticides and herbicides and fungicides on fruit by washing it. But I do think there's real questions about farm worker safety and who's getting sprayed with that stuff. Um, and the water table. The water table, yep, that's another question. I have a 50-foot well in Watsonville, so I'll be, I'll be on the front line of that problem <laughs> when it comes down to it. Yeah, um, so that's that's interesting space to work in. I mean, there's less intense environmental monitoring over there than there is in some of the coastal areas here and along our Riparian creeks. Um, yeah, I mean, water's interesting. Uh, People living, so many people living in close proximity to one another. Is it almost eight, 15 minutes? Oh, that went fast. Yeah, I'm just talk and talk and talk, can I? Sensorious. <laughs> what is the name of that search, <coughs> you know, find your, find your project? Oh, so there's two of them. The Zooniverse is a very specific, so this is almost all online citizen science projects, things you can do from your computer. It's usually photo classification and watching videos and identifying something in it or transcribing. Um, there's some museums that have put their card catalogs up on there so that you can help them to digitize their cards. So, you know, that really <coughs> tickles some people's votes. Like, yes, I want to contribute that way. Other people are like, oh my god, get me outside if I'm going to be doing something. But anything for anybody, really. Size. Size and SciStarter is the big search engine. They're trying to move to be that sort of aggregating central engine. Um, these guys are fascinating. The woman who runs this, she's a, uh, she used to be a cheerleader. She runs a group called the uh, uh, Science Cheerleaders, where she gets professional cheerleaders to be champions of science and like project the image of cheerleaders as intellectual. Advocates people, they go to schools in their uniforms and then do science experiments for kids. It's like very weird, but she has a vision where she recognizes, so um, I'll get into the weeds here a little bit. Running a citizen science project is tricky. You have people and you were just saying, like, oh, I don't put all my data into eBird. It's like nobody puts all their data into eBird, but how do you how do you continuously recruit people, get them to know enough about what you're doing, that they're submitting good data, but then let them move, move on. And so she's really trying to build a world where you become a volunteer. You have a space, a community that you come to, and you're like, Mom, I'm done with Habitat Network. Like, I'm at my yard. I put in my bird feeder, and I built a bee house. And like, that's as far as I'm going to be able to go there. Maybe I'll update that map once a year. But instead of me, like, holding on to you with a stranglehold and not wanting to share you with any other projects. She has a vision where you know you let people move to a new project and like explore another interest, gain more expertise in a different area, and let volunteers, people who are willing to put some of that cognitive surplus to this other stuff. And it is so important. Like I just even people in the room have just said, oh, we're doing all these little things. We're restoring the beach habitat. It's like, that is really awesome for the locals. But in order to make a real impact on science, you have to be documenting that work in some kind of centralized database where we can see that change over time, which is why tools like Habitat Network exist as a, a way to aggregate that data so that it becomes more than the sum of its parts. Right? So you can start to really have an impact. And 
if I had more time, I could get in, pull up my slides about science communication and how throwing information at people doesn't really create behavioral changes at all. The thing that does get people to change is just that they see other people are doing this stuff. So the thing that will make you put solar panels on your house is not that you understand they'll save you money, it's that you think they look cool in your neighborhood and your neighbor that you want to be like has them. Like that's, that's all it really comes down to when you're talking about it, um, change, which is why you see pockets of things like this happen. Tesla has those neat tiles now. I know, I like those <coughs> tiles too, but they're on one single house, right? <laughs> His. <laughs> um, so yeah, she's really got this vision where people become science volunteers and we pass, you know, they, become, they, they contribute in so many different ways depending on you know, the time they have available, what they're actually interested in at any given moment, what's happening in their personal lives that might be driving a particular interest in something. So it's a real bold perspective that conflicts with how project managers manage their volunteers, which is with a death grip. No, don't leave me. How will I forget what I need if my numbers are, don't stay the same? If I don't retain my volunteers, it's a big issue. So, and it's going to go ahead and rough, as I say, it's going to be a rough, a rough time for projects like this. Um, the funding sources are going to be a little skim from the federal government for a while, so we uh, are all hoping to survive that by building a big basis of people. Good question. How did Cornell get at the forefront of the bird industry? Arthur Allen was just a visionary guy. Yeah. Um, he, he was doing bird research. Lots of people did bird research, but he started inviting people to come out on his field walks with him around Ithaca. And he, the people would come. Circa? Uh, 1950s. Yeah, okay. Um, and so he would invite people out, and then we'd go out together, and then that sort of evolved into other projects. We. Um, some tech people at the lab were really interested in how to visualize data on maps. So it, it boggles my mind that the maps are just barely over 10 years, like the access to satellite imagery is just barely, 2006 is when Google Maps came out. And it's hard to imagine a world where you didn't have access to that layer of information, right? Like I can barely remember not having that available. Um, so Google was, and that Google, so Cornell was instrumental figuring out how to display, it seems so trivial now, uh, points of information on a map in the 90s. They're actually a big, they have a big uh, copyright thing with Google about who actually invented that technology. So that was a big deal. Like they, that technological innovation allowed them to start visualizing data on maps <coughs> earlier than almost any other entity and seeing the um, potential of that as a tool for citizen science, because that's what people really want. They don't want to just give you data on paper, but being able to see that data <laughs> spit back out at them on a map is sure. profound. So now people get out of eBird when they land in a new city if they're Twitchers. Twitchers are people who <laughs> like to look for birds wherever they go. Like if, they, if something cool is there, they go get it. That's perfect. So they'll land on the airplane. The first thing they'll do is they'll open eBird and see what other people have reported in the local area and see what cool rare birds they haven't gotten on their life lists. And then you can look on a map like, oh, it's like Golden Gate Park. And they head right there and they see their oyster catcher or whatever it is they haven't seen before. <coughs> so many people come from California. Tohi. And it's I know. Such a <laughs> That's a garbage bird. bird. All in California. <laughs> and everybody comes from all over the world. That bird keeps me up at night. Like, it's petty. There it is, you know, right in front of you. <laughs> I saw a Wilson's petrol, and now my flight is complete. Now you're done. <laughs> yeah, all right. Dad contented. Well, I'll take a gold needle any day. Yeah, that's a good one. What's the name of that book that you? I can't um, believe I didn't bring my pencil. What's the name of the book that you uh, that had all of? Yes. <laughs> I'll put it in the order for so it. We'll see book. if we get some copies from the library. That's a book. Oh, great. Okay. Great. Oh, great. Oh, great. Oh, great. Good. I'll, I'll put an order in. We don't have it at the library. That would be yeah, nice. It's brand new. I think it just came out in May. So it's going to be a. Okay. And we can put some of this information on our museum website, too. Yeah, okay, anything you want. Okay. It's more than Are we getting the Bees of California, too? I'm not it. I'll write it down. It's wonderful. The Bees of California. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Do you have a website? Have it, have so, you know, Berkeley and Berkeley guys, and oh. they did some of the research. You were here in Ithaca. Oh, so well, we well I live in Watson Valley, work out of my garage. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> um, I lived in Ithaca for many years. 
I've lived here. My husband's a strawberry breeder. <laughs> Is the camera off? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, yeah, so my website is um, habitat.net. Um, 